Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Monster God of Mammoth by Edmund Hamilton Out of the desert night he came to us, stumbling into our little circle of firelight and collapsing at once. Mitchell and I sprang to our feet with startled exclamations for men who travel alone and on foot or a strange sight in the deserts of North Africa. For the first few minutes that we worked over him, I thought he would die at once, but gradually we brought him back to consciousness. While Mitchell held a cup of water to his cracked lips, I looked him over and saw that he was too far gone to live much longer. His clothes were in rags, and his hands and knees literally flayed from crawling over the sands. I judged. So when he motioned feebly for more water, I gave it to him, knowing that in any case his time was short. Soon he could talk, in a dead, croaking voice. I'm alone, he told us, in answer to our first question, no more out there to look for. What are you two, traitors? I thought so. No, I'm an archaeologist, a digger up of the past. His voice broke for a moment. It's not always good to dig up dead secrets. There are some things the past should be allowed to hide. He caught the look that passed between Mitchell and me. No, I'm not mad. He said, you'll hear. I'll tell you the whole thing. But listen to me, you two. And in his earnestness, he raised himself to a sitting position. Keep out of Igidi Desert. Remember that I told you that. I had a warning too, but I disregarded it. And I went into hell. Into hell. But there, I will tell you from the beginning. My name, that doesn't matter now. I left Mogador more than a year ago and came through the foothills of the Atlas Ranges, striking out into the desert in hopes of finding some of the Carthaginian ruins the North African deserts are known to hold. I spent months in the search, traveling among the squalid Arab villages, now near an oasis, and now far into the black, untracked desert. And as I went further into that savage country, I found more and more of the ruins I sought, crumbled remnants of temples and fortresses, relics, almost destroyed, of the age when Carthage meant empire and ruled all of North Africa from her walled city. And then, on the side of a massive block stone, I found that which turned me toward Igidi. It was an inscription in the garbled Phoenician of the traitors of Carthage, short enough so that I remembered it and can repeat it word for word. It read literally as follows. Merchants, go not into the city of Mamurth, which lies beyond the mountain pass. Fry Sandrabat of Carthage, entering the city with four companions in the month of Eshmun, to trade on the third night of our stay came priest and seized my fellows, I escaping by hiding. My companions they sacrifice to the evil god of the city, who has dwelt there from the beginning of time, and for whom the wise men of Mamurth have built a great temple the like of which is not on earth elsewhere, where the people of Mamurth worship their god. I escaped from the city and set this warning here that others may not turn their steps to Mamurth and to death. Perhaps you can imagine the effect that inscription had on me. It was the last trace of a city unknown to the memory of men, a last floating spar of a civilization sunken in the sea of time. That there could have been such a city at all seemed to me quite probable. What do we know of Carthage, even but a few names? No city, no civilization was ever so completely blotted off the earth as Carthage. When Roman Scipio ground its temples and palaces into the very dust and plowed up the ground with salt, and the eagles of conquering Rome flew across the desert where Metropolis had been. It was on the outskirts of one of those wretched little Arab villages that had found the block and its inscription, and I tried to find someone in the village to accompany me, but none would do so. 
I could plainly see the mountain pass, a mere crack between towering blue cliffs. In reality, it was miles and miles away, but the deceptive optical qualities of the desert light made it seem very near. My maps placed that mountain range all right, as a lower branch of the atlas, and the expanse behind the mountains was marked as Igidi Desert, but that was all I got from them. All that I could reckon on as certain was that it was desert that lay on the other side of the pass, and I must carry enough supplies to meet it. But the Arabs knew more. Though I offered what must have been fabulous riches to those poor devils, not one would come with me when I let them know the place I was heading for. None had ever been there. They would not even ride far into the desert in that direction. But all had very definite ideas of the place beyond the mountains as a nest of devils, a haunt of evil jinns. Knowing how firmly superstition is implanted in their kind, I tried no longer to persuade them, and started alone, with two scrawny camels carrying my water and supplies. So for three days I forged across the desert under a broiling sun, and on the morning of the fourth I reached the pass. It was only a narrow crevice to begin with, and great boulders were strewn so thickly on its floor that it was a long, hard job getting through and the cliffs on each side towered to such a height that the space between was a place of shadows and whispers and semi-darkness. It was late in the afternoon when I finally came through, and for a moment I stood motionless, for from that side of the pass the desert sloped down into a vast basin, and at the basin's center, perhaps two miles from where I stood, gleamed the white ruins of Marmuth. I remembered that I was very calm, as I covered the two miles between myself and the ruins. I had taken the existence of the city as a fact, so much so that if the ruins had not been there, I should have been vastly more surprised than at finding them. From the past, I had seen only a tangled mass of white fragments, but as I drew nearer, some of these began taking outline as crumbling blocks and walls and columns. The sand had drifted too, and the ruins were completely buried in some sections, while nearly all were half covered and then it was that I made a curious discovery. I had stopped to examine the material of the ruins, a smooth, veinless stone, much like an artificial marble or superfine concrete, and while I looked about me, intent on this, I noticed that on almost every shaft and block, on broken cornice and column, was carved the same symbol, if it was a symbol. It was a rough picture of a queer, outlandish creature, much like an octopus, with a round, almost shapeless body and several long tentacles or arms branching out from the body, not supple and boneless like those of an octopus, but seemingly stiff and jointed like a spider's legs. In fact, the thing might have been intended to represent a spider. I thought, though, some of the details were wrong. I speculated for a moment on the profusion of these creatures carved in the ruins all around me, then gave it up as an enigma that was unsolvable. And the riddle of the city about me seemed unsolvable also. What could I find in this half-buried mass of stone fragments to throw light on the past? I could not even superficially explore the place, for the scantiness of my supplies and water would not permit a long stay. It was with a discouraged heart that I went back to the camels and, leading them to an open spot in the ruins, made my camp for the night. And when night had fallen, and I sat beside my little fire, the vast brooding silence of this place of death was awful. There was no laughing human voices, or cries of animals, or even cries of birds or insects. There was nothing but the darkness and silence that crowded around me, flowed down upon me, beat sullenly against the glowing spears of light, my little fire throughout. As I sat there musing, I was startled by a slight sound behind me. I turned to see its cause, and then stiffened. As I have mentioned, the space directly around my camp was clear, sand smooth level by the wind. Well, as I stared at that flat expanse of sand, a hole several inches across suddenly appeared in its surface, yards from where I stood, but clearly visible in the firelight. There was nothing whatsoever to be seen there, not even a shadow. But there it was. One moment the level surface of the sand, the next moment a hole appearing in it, accompanied by a soft, crunching sound. As I stood gazing at it in wonder, that sound was repeated, and simultaneously another hole appeared in the sand surface, five or six feet nearer to me than the other. When I saw that ice-tipped arrows of fear 
seemed to shoot through me, and then yielding to a mad impulse, I snatched a blazing piece of fuel from the fire and hurled it, a comet of red flame, at the place where the holes had appeared. There was a slight sound of scurrying and shuffling, and I felt that whatever thing had made those marks had retreated, if a living thing had made them at all. What it had been I could not imagine, for there had been absolutely nothing in sight, one track and then another appearing magically in the clear sand, if indeed there were tracks at all. The mystery of the thing haunted me. Even in sleep I found no rest, for evil dreams seemed to flow into my brain from the dead city around me. All the dusty sins of ages passed, and the forgotten place seemed to be focused on me in the dreams I had. Strange shapes walked through them, unearthly as the spawn of a distant star, half seen and vanishing again. It was little enough sleep I got that night, but when the sun finally came, with its first golden rays, my fears and impressions dropped from me like a cloak. No wonder the early peoples were sun worshippers. And with my renewed strength and courage, a new thought struck me. In the inscription I have quoted to you, that long-dead merchant adventurer had mentioned the great temple of the city and dwelt on its grandeur. Where then were its ruins? I wondered. I decided that what time I had would be better spent in investigating the ruins of this temple, which should be prominent if that ancient Carthaginian had been correct as to its size. I ascended a nearby hillock and looked about me in all directions, and though I could not perceive any vast pile of ruins that might have been the temples, I did see for the first time far away two great figures of stone that stood out black against the rosy flame of the sunrise. It was a discovery that filled me with excitement, and I broke camp at once starting in the direction of those two shapes. They were on the very edge of the farther side of the city, and it was noon before I finally stood before them. And now I saw clearly their nature. Two great sitting figures carved of black stone, all of fifty feet in height, and almost that far apart, facing both toward the city and toward me. They were of human shape and dressed in a queer scaled armor, but the faces I cannot describe for they were unhuman. The features were human, well proportioned, even, but the face, the expression, suggested no kinship whatever with humanity as we know it. Were they carved from life? I wondered if so. It must have been a strange sort of people who had lived in the city and set up these two statues. And now I tore my gaze away from them and looked around. On each side of those shapes, the remains of what must have once been a mighty wall branched out, a long pile of crumbling ruins. But there had been no walls between the statues, that being evidently the gateway through the barrier. I wondered why the two guardians of the gate had survived, apparently entirely unharmed, while the wall and the city behind me had fallen into ruins. They were of a different material, I could see, but what was that material? And now I noticed for the first time the long avenue that began on the other side of the statues and stretched away into the desert for a half mile or more. The sides of this avenue were two rows of smaller stone figures that ran in parallel lines away from the two colossi. So I started down that avenue passing between the two great shapes that stood at its head and as I went between them I noticed for the first time the inscription graven on the inner side of each. On the pedestal of each figure four or five feet from the ground was a raised tablet of the same material, perhaps a yard square, and covered with strange symbols, characters, no doubt, of a lost language, undecipherable at least to me. One symbol, though, that was especially prominent in the inscription was not new to me. It was the carven picture of the spider or octopus, which I have mentioned that I had found everywhere on the ruins of the city, and here it was scattered thickly among the symbols that made up the inscription. The tablet on the other statue was a replica of the first, and I could learn no more from it. So I started down the avenue, turning over my mind the riddle of that omnipresent symbol, and then forgetting it as I observed the things about me. That long street was like the avenue of sphinxes at Karnak, down which Pharaoh swung in his litter, borne to his temple on the necks of men. But the statues that made up its sides were not sphinx-shaped. They were carved in strange forms, shapes of animals unknown to us, as far removed from anything we can imagine as the beast of another world. 
I cannot describe them any more than you could describe a dragon to a man who has been blind all his life. Yet they were of evil reptilian shapes. They tore at my nerves as I looked at them. Down between the two rows of them I went, until I came to the end of the avenue. Standing there between the last two figures, I could see nothing before me but the yellow sands of the desert, as far as the eye could reach. I was puzzled. What had been the object of all the pains that had been taken, the wall, the two great statues, and this long avenue, if it but led into the desert? Gradually I began to see that there was something queer about the part of the desert that lay directly before me. It was flat. For an area seemingly round in shape that must have covered several acres, the surface of the desert seemed absolutely level. It was as though the sands within the great circle had been packed down with tremendous force, leaving not even the littlest ridge of dune on its surface. Beyond this flat area and all around it, the desert was broken up by small hills and valleys, and traversed by whirling sand clouds, but nothing stirred on the flat surface of the circle. Interested at once, I strode forward to the edge of the circle. Only a few yards away, I had just reached that edge, when an invisible hand seemed to strike me a great blow on the face and chest, knocking me backward in the sand. It was a minute before I advanced again. But I did advance, for all my curiosity was now aroused. I crawled toward the circle's edge, holding my pistol before me, pushing slowly forward. When the automatic in my outstretched hand reached the line of the circle, it struck against something hard, and I could push it no further. It was exactly as if it had struck against the side of a wall, but no wall or anything else was to be seen. Reaching out my hand, I touched the same hard barrier, and in a moment I was on my feet for I knew now that it was solid matter I had run into, not force. When I thrust out my hands, the edge of the circle was as far as they would go, for there they met a smooth wall, totally invisible yet at the same time quite material, and the phenomenon was one which even I could partly understand. Somehow in the dead past the scientist of the city behind me, the wise men mentioned in the inscription, had discovered the secret of making solid matter invisible and had applied it to the work that I was now examining. Such a thing was far from impossible. Even our own scientists can make matter partly invisible. With the X-ray, evidently these people had known the whole process, a secret that had been lost in the succeeding ages, like the secret of hard gold and malleable glass, and others that we find mentioned in ancient writings. Yet I wondered how they had done this, so that ages after those who had built the thing were wind-driven dust, it remained as invisible as ever. I stood back and threw pebbles into the air towards the circle. No matter how high I threw them, when they reached the line of the circle's edge, they rebounded with a clicking sound, so I knew that the wall must tower to a great height above me. I was on fire to get inside the wall and examine the place from the inside. But how to do it? There must be an entrance, but where? And I suddenly remembered the two guardian statues at the head of the great avenue, with their carven tablets, and wondered what connection they had with this place. Suddenly the strangeness of the whole thing struck me like a blow. The great unseen wall before me, the circle of sand, flat and unchanging, and myself, standing there and wondering, wondering. A voice from out the dead city behind me seemed to sound in my heart, bidding me to turn and flee, to get away. I remembered the warning of the inscription. Go not to Marmuth. And as I thought of the inscription, I had no doubt that this was the great temple, described by San Jobat. Surely he was right. The like of it was not on earth elsewhere. But I would not go. I could not go. Until I had examined the wall from the inside. Calmly reasoning the matter, I decided that the logical place for the gateway through the wall would be at the end of the avenue, so that those who came down the street would pass directly through the wall. And my reasoning was good, for it was at that spot that I found the entrance and opening in the barrier, several yards wide, and running higher than I could reach, how high I had no means of telling. I felt my way through the gate, and stepped at once upon a floor of hard material, not as smooth as the wall surface, but equally invisible. Inside the entrance lay a corridor of equal width, leading into the center of the circle, and I felt my way forward. 
I must have made a strange picture, had there been any there to observe it, for while I knew that all around me were the towering invisible walls, and I knew not what else, yet all my eyes could see was the great flat circle of sand beneath me, carpeted with the afternoon sunshine. Only I seemed to be walking a foot above the ground in thin air. That was the thickness of the floor beneath me, and it was the weight of this great floor. I knew that held the circle of sand under it forever flat and unchanging. I walked slowly down the passageway, with hands outstretched before me, and had gone but a short distance when I brought up against another smooth wall that lay directly across the corridor, seemingly making it a blind alley. But I was not discouraged now, for I knew that there must be a door somewhere and began to feel me in search of it. I found the door, and groping about the sides of the corridor, my hands encountered a smoothly rounded knob set in the wall, and as I laid my hand on this, the door opened. There was a sighing, as of a little wind, and when I again felt my way forward, the wall that had lain across the passageway was gone, and I was free to go forward, but I dared not go through at once. I went back to the knob on the wall, and found that no amount of pressing or twisting of it would close the door that had opened. Some subtle mechanism within the knob had operated that needed only a touch of the hand to work it, and the whole end of the corridor had moved out of the way, sliding up in grooves, I think, like a portoculus, though of this I am not sure. But the door was safely opened, and I passed through it. Moving about like a blind man in a strange place, I found that I was in a vast inner court, the walls of which sloped away in great curve. When I discovered this, I came back to the spot where the corridor opened into the court, then walked straight out into the court itself. It was steps that I encountered, the first broad steps of what was evidently a staircase of titanic proportions, and I went up slowly, carefully, feeling before me every foot of the way. It was only the feel of the staircase under me that gave reality to it, for as far as I could see, I was simply climbing up into empty space. It was weird beyond telling. Up and up I went, until I was all of a hundred feet above the ground, and then the staircase narrowed, the sides drew together. A few more steps, and I came out on a flat floor again, which, after some groping about, I found to be a broad landing, with high railed edges. I crawled across this landing on hands and knees, and then struck against another wall, and in it another door. I went through this too, still crawling, and though everything about me was still invisible, I sensed that I was no longer in the open air, but in a great room. I stopped short, and then, as I crouched on the floor, I felt a sudden presence of evil, of some malignant, menacing entity that was native here. Nothing I could see or hear, but strong upon my brain beat the thought of something infinitely ancient, infinitely evil, that was a part of this place. Was it a consciousness, I wonder, of the horror that had filled the place in ages long dead? Whatever caused it, I could go no further in the face of the terror that possessed me. So I drew back and walked to the edge of the landing, leaning over its high invisible railing and surveying the scene below. The setting sun hung like a great ball of red-hot iron in the western sky, and in its lurid rays the two great statues cast long shadows on the yellow sands. Not far away my two camels hobbled moved restlessly about. To all appearance I was standing on thin air, a hundred feet or more above the ground, but in my mind's eye I had a picture of the great courts and corridors below me through which I have felt my way. As I mused there in the red light, it was clear to me that this was the great temple of the city. What a sight it must have been in the time of the city's life. I could imagine the long procession of priests and people, in somber and gorgeous robes, coming out from the city between the great statues and down the long avenue, dragging with them perhaps an unhappy prisoner to sacrifice to their god in this his temple. The sun was now dipping beneath the horizon, and I turned to go. But before ever I moved, I became rigid, and my heart seemed to stand still. For on the further edge of the clear stretch of sand that lay beneath the temple and the city, a hole suddenly appeared in the sand, springing into being on the desert's face exactly like the one I had seen at my campfire the night before. I watched as fascinated as by the eye of a snake, and before my eyes another and another appeared not in a straight line, but in a zigzag fashion. Two such holes would be punched down on one side, then two more on the other side, then one in the middle, 
making a series of tracks, perhaps two yards in width from side to side, and advancing straight toward the temple and myself. And I could see nothing. It was like the comparison suddenly struck me, like the tracks of a many-legged insect might make in the sand, only magnified to unheard-of proportions. And with that thought, the truth crushed on me, for I remembered the spider carved on the ruins and on the statues, and I knew now that it had signified to the dwellers in the city what was it the inscriptions had said, the evil god of the city who has dwelt there from the beginning of time. And as I saw those tracks advancing toward me, I knew that the city's ancient evil god still dwelt there, and that I was in his temple alone and unarmed. What strange creatures might there not have been in the dawn of time? And this one, this gigantic monster in a spider's form, had not those who built the city found it here when they came, and in awe, taken it as the city's god, and built for it the mighty temple in which I now stood? And they, who had the wisdom and art to make this vast vein invisible, not to be seen by human eyes, had they done the same to their god? and made of him almost a true god, invisible, powerful, undying, undying. Almost it must have been to survive the ages as it had done, yet I knew that even some kinds of parrots live for centuries, and what could I know of this monstrous relic of dead ages? And when the city died and crumbled, and the victims were no longer brought to its lair in the temple, did it not live, as I thought, by ranging the desert? No wonder the Arabs had feared the country, in this direction. It would be death for anything that came even within view of such a horror, that could catch and spring and chase, and yet remain always unseen. And was it death for me? Such were some of the thoughts that pounded through my brain as I watched death approach. Were those steadily advancing tracks in the sand, and now the paralysis of terror that had gripped me was broken, and I ran down the great staircase and into the court, I could think of no place in that great hall. I might hide. Imagine hiding in a place where all is invisible, but I must go some place, and finally I dashed past the foot of the great staircase until I reached the wall directly under the landing on which I had stood, and against this I crouched, praying that the deepening shadows of dusk might hide me from the gaze of the creature whose lair this was. I knew instantly when the thing entered the gate through which I too had come. Pad, pad, pad. That was the soft, cushioned sound of its passage. I heard the feet stop for a moment by the open door at the end of the corridor. Perhaps it was in surprise that the door was open, I thought, for how could I know how great or little intelligence lay in that unseen creature's brain? Then, pad, pad, across the court it came, and I heard the soft sound of its passing as it ascended the staircase. I had not been afraid to breathe. I would almost have screamed with relief. Yet still fear held me, and I remained crouched against the wall, while the thing went up the great stairs. Imagine that scene. All around me was absolutely nothing visible, nothing but the great flat circle of sand that lay a foot below me, yet I saw the place with my mind's eye. I knew of the walls and courts that lay about me, and the thing above me, in fear of which I was crouching there in the gathering darkness. The sound of feet above me had ceased, and I judged that the thing had gone into the great room above, which I had feared to enter. Now if ever was the time to make my escape in the darkness, so I rose with infinite carefulness and softly walked across the court to the door that led to the corridor. But when I had walked only half of the distance as I thought, I crashed squarely into another invisible wall across my path and fell backward, the metal handle of the sheath knife at my belt striking the flooring with a loud clang. God help me. I had misjudged the position of the door and had to walk straight into the wall instead. I lay there motionless, with cold fear flooding every part of my being. Then pad, pad, the soft steps of the thing across the landing, and then silence for a moment. Could it see me from the landing? I wondered. Could it? For a moment hopes warmed me, as no sound came. But the next instant I knew that death had me by the throat, for pad, pad, down the stairs it came. With that sound, my last vestige of self-control fled, and I scrambled to my feet and made another mad dash in the direction of the door. Crash! Into another wall. I went and rose to my feet, trembling. There was no sound of footsteps now, and as quietly as I could, I walked into the great court 
still further as I thought for all my ideas of direction were hopelessly confused. God, what a weird game it was we played there on that darkened circle of sand. No sound whatever came from the thing that hunted me, and my hope flickered up again, and with a dreadful irony it was at that exact moment that I walked straight into the thing. My outstretched hand touched and grasped what must have been one of its limbs, thick and cold and hairy, which was instantly torn from my grasp, and then seized me again, while another and another clutched me also. The thing had stood quite still, leaving me to walk directly into its grasp. The drum of the spider and the fly. A moment only it held me, for that cold grasp filled me with such deep shuddering abhorrence that I wrenched myself loose and fled madly across the court, stumbling again on the first step of the great staircase. I raced up the stairs, and even as I ran I heard the thing in pursuit. Up I went, and across the landing, and grasped the edge of the railing, for I meant to throw myself down from there to a clean death on the floor below, but under my hands the top of the railing moved. One of the great blocks that evidently made up its top was loosened and rocked toward me. In a flash I grasped the great block and staggered across the landing with it in my arms to the head of the staircase. Two men could hardly have lifted it, I think, yet I did more, in a sudden excess of mad strength, for as I heard that monster coming swiftly up the great stairs, I raised the block, invisible as ever, above my head, and sent it crashing down the staircase upon the place where I thought the thing was at the moment. For an instant after the crash there was silence, and then a low humming sound began that waxed into a loud droning, and at that same time, at a spot halfway down the staircase, where the block had crashed, a thin, purple liquid seemed to well out of the empty air, giving form to a few of the invisible steps as it flowed over them, and outlining, too, the block I had thrown, and a great hairy limb that lay crushed beneath it, and from which the fluid that was the monster's blood was oozing. I had not killed the thing, but had chained it down with the block that held it prisoner. There was a thrashing sound on the staircase, and the purple stream ran more freely, and by the outline of its splashes I saw dimly the monstrous god that had been known in Marmuth in ages past. It was like a giant spider, with angled limbs that were yards long, and a hairy, repellent body. Even as I stood there I wondered that the thing, invisible as it was, was yet visible by the lifeblood in it, when that blood was spilled. Yet so it was nor can I even suggest a reason, but one glimpse I got of its half-visible purple splash outline, and then, hugging the further side of the stairs, I descended. When I passed the thing, the intolerable odor of a crushed insect almost smothered me, and the monster itself made frantic efforts to loosen itself and spring at me, but it could not, and I got safely down, shuddering and hardly able to walk. Straight across the great court I went, and ran shakily through the corridor, and down the long avenue, and out between the two great statues. The moonlight shone on them, and the tablets of inscription stood out clearly on the sides of the statues, with their strange symbols and carved spider forms, but I knew now what their message was. It was well that my camels had wandered into the ruins, for such was the fear that struck through me that I would never have returned for them had they lingered by the invisible wall. All that night I rode to the north, and when morning came I did not stop, but still pushed north, and as I went through the mountain pass, one camel stumbled and fell, and in falling burst open all my water supplies that were lashed on its back. No water at all was left, but it still held north, killing the other camel by my constant speed, and then staggered on foot. On hands and knees I crawled forward, when my legs gave out, always north, away from that temple of evil and its evil god, and tonight, I have been crawling how many miles I do not know, and I saw your fire, and that is all. He lay back exhausted, and Mitchell and I looked at each other's face in the firelight. Then rising, Mitchell strode to the edge of our camp and looked for a long time at the moonlit desert, which lay toward the south. What his thoughts were, I do not know. I was nursing my own as I watched the man who lay beside our fire. It was early the next morning that he died, muttering about great walls around him. We wrapped his body securely, and bearing it with us, held our way across the desert. In Algiers we cabled to the friends whose address we found in his money belt, and arranged to ship the body to them, for such had been his only request. Later they wrote that had been buried in the little churchyard of the New England village that had been his childhood home. I do not think that his sleep there 
will be troubled by dreams of that place of evil, which he fled. I pray that it will not. Often and often have Mitchell and I discussed the thing over lonely campfires and in the inns of the seaport towns. Did he kill the invisible monster he spoke of? And is it lying now, a withered remnant, under the block on the great staircase? Or did it gnaw its way loose? Does it still roam the desert and make its lair in the vast ancient temple as unseen as itself? Or different still? Was a man simply crazed by the heat and thirst of the desert, and his tale but the product of a maddened mind? I do not think that this is so. I think that he told the truth, yet I do not know. Nor shall I ever know, for never. Mitchell and I have decided shall we be the ones to venture into the place of hell on earth, where that ancient god of evil may still be living, amid the invisible courts and towers, beyond the unseen wall.